Good morning, El Harvey people. Maybe we'll be at a church of three minutes late today. <laughs> we'll see. But it's a three-day weekend in the Whistler Storm, and it's a 50-cent day in the valley, so it's hard to compete. But why don't you share any announcements that you might have for the life of the church first? And we've got me? Bob. Uh, Wednesday uh, this week is our annual meeting. The hot lot starts at 6 o'clock, and then the annual meeting starts at 7. We hope that everybody will be there. Uh, the one thing that we did about two, little over two years ago is we uh, changed the bylaws temporarily to see how they would work for a while. And uh, just like the changing of the forms uh, and stuff like that were included in that, we'd like to adopt those permanently and we'd like to propose that. And the, uh, the other thing that I wanted to uh, reiterate was uh, next Saturday at the Liberty Center will be the uh, Ducapo concert. It is not Sunday this time uh, because of the conflict with this uh, the ski, uh, ski touring. So it's Saturday afternoon at 4 o'clock at the Liberty Center. And then there's another one, you can't make Saturday at Friday between the first congregation of the church at 2 o'clock. On Sunday? Other announcements for the life of the church? Yeah. It, go for it. This isn't necessarily the life of the church, but something else's life. Yes. Bernie uh, and I were in Vietnam recently, and uh, we didn't take any malaria pills. So we have malaria pills left over. Jeanette has one package. Anybody like, hey, I don't know what Honduras requires, but if you know anybody who needs a series of malaria pills that are traveling, they're good until 10 or 11. December. December? December, yeah. So, you know, let it, let it burn your eye Thanks. So, malaria pills for the taking. Right. Um, next Saturday, also at 6 o'clock, there is a soup and song concert at the Nativity of Lutheran Church, and that benefits the way station and Mount Washington Valley recovers. It's uh, Bennett Perkins. They, this is their third annual concert. You can come and you can eat soup, and then you get a ceramic bowl that was made by a potter. So you get to take home a bowl. And you can listen to Bennett and Perkins, and your, your ticket price will help these two organizations. So. One of those guide to donate opportunities that are coming up. I sent out an email about several of them. I have two more to add, so that's one of them. But what time is that one? That's six to nine. Six o'clock, I think, is the soup supper. Probably seven o'clock is when the concert oh, starts. Seven. Yes. So yeah, so you can go from the capital down to North Cover oh, if you want. You know, good music all around. Mm-hmm. Many of the sequels, not all, but I think many of them are made by Jimmy Illinois. Yeah. And uh, I'm going for you just to collect the suit. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Any more announcements for like the church, the community?
this is like these little chairs. The trick is to get all the way around the two whole aisles. And this is the sparse crab here, so. This is a sparse crab. Feels like training. So you might as well rise because we are going to start with this song, My Life Flows On in Endless Song, which is on page 4, 27, 135. We're going to do 
Um, two people have told me I'm special, and I know others think that too. I have three gifts from God. It's not how rich or poor or smart you are, it's what's in your heart. Some of the most important people are known by many people, and some people are known by many, but understood by few like me. Please pray, pray for my friend Alex from Kitty Van Peach. She's not feeling well. I don't know what's going on with her, but I'm really worried about her. Please pray for me, because sometimes I get scatterbrain or space brain at work, and I need to be able to focus at work. And God bless all of you. I love this. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, so there's a lot of concerns there and thanks, thankfulnesses. So um, Kevin frequently prays for many of the ministers in the valley and the people at the way station. And um, for any friend that he knows that's in need of some hope or help, and then he's usually grateful for a lot of good things. So thank you. Other prayers, Bob? Uh, many of you probably heard on the news this week about the Holy Cross Royalty that was in the bad accident. For the Holy Cross rowing team, for the young woman who lost her life, for all the others, and for those who love them and are responding to what has happened to them, we lift them up in our prayers. I saw other hands. I mean, go ahead. My niece is lost. She's fighting cancer for the second time. For Irene's niece, Florence, who's living cancer for the second time. Um, um, prayer of uh, celebration for a dear family friend, Catalina, who had her 98th birthday on Friday. The 98th birthday of a dear friend, Catalina, and her long and storied life. of Australia for the first responders that continue to be hard pressed by that. And the, and the animals, the people and the animals and that whole continent. Sue? Please keep in your prayers our friend Steel, Peacock, and Sasha as both of them are beginning a new chapter in their medical care. For our friend Sasha, for Seal, and for Judy, who you so faithfully brought to this community, and who was also in other hands being taken care of. Yes, thank you. But of course, we also ask for prayers of celebration because, given how heavy sometimes the world feels, we need some joy. And this morning, the 8 o'clock offered up. The sighting and the near miss because it got, was on the road but flew away just in time of a white winged crossbill, which is a boreal bird. And it's quite colorful and its beak it, uh, crisscrosses like that. And I asked why, and it's because it eats out of pine cones. So it's very handy to have the executive director of the Tin Mountain Conservation Center at your 8 o'clock. She can answer almost any question you have about birds. <laughs> Are there prayers of celebration for anything that's going on in your lives? Are there any sightings of something special this week? Kevin? I'm just grateful and for um, the way station and all the people who help me and support me and to have a job and a nice apartment and just very grateful. I get gratitude for our shelter and a job and a place that takes care of us in the spaces between those. If you're curious about Kevin's story, ask him later and he can tell you about moving from living in his truck to having his own home. It's a big deal. Well, how about if we also are grateful for a 50 cent day in the valley? Does everybody know what a 50 cent day is? If you don't know what a 50 cent day is, it's a tradition here in the valley 
that they rate our weather, 50% is, or 50 cents is equivalent to 100%. So they take off a nickel for everything that's wrong with the day. So if you get a 50% of 50 cent day forecast, that would be perfect day according to Ed Bergeron from the radio. So he rated today as a 50 cent day. He doesn't do that too often. Let us pray. Oh, holy God, we have lifted up to you people whose bodies, minds, hearts, and lives are changing or compromised or challenged. We need your loving and healing presence. We have lifted up parts of the world like Australia. And we lift up always our partner church, the Takanga Church in the city of Mutare, in the nation of Zimbabwe. We lift up the lives of people and animals, and we especially ask for your presence with first responders and those who have been called into harm's way because they serve in our military or in our police and our fire departments near or far. They are at risk. And we ask that you will be with them and bring them home safe. And bring home safe those that they are taking care of. We ask for your healing presence, your comforting presence, where loss has occurred, where death or change is taking such a great toll. And we have people that are grieving. And we ask that you will remind us of joy like the white winged crossbill, or the 50 cent day in the fluffy snow and the blue sky. Remind us that we are designed for delight, and that at the bottom of every well there is a light that reflects back, and it is within us, and it is ours to grab onto, and hold on to with hope and joy. Hear now our silence. Hear us as we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Lori, if you would come up forward first and read the scripture, and then Bob will be another piece for us. John 12 through 27 verse. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say, Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Luke 22, 39 through 24. He came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. When he reached the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not come into a time of trial. Then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him and gave him strength. In his anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. Matthew 7, verse 7. Ask 
ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will open to you. Peter 5 through 7. Cast all of your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Psalm 107 through 28. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. This reading is from a fictional novel by Louise Penny of the name of Still Life. And it's uh, Detective from Austin speaking, saying, There are four things that lead to wisdom. Are you ready for them? She nodded, wondering where the police work, when the police work would begin. There are four sentences we learn to say in the Gamash held up his hand as a fist and raised a finger at each point. I don't know. I need help. I'm sorry. I was wrong. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. <coughs> so today, of course, is the day before Martin Luther King Day. And last week we talked about the fact that Christ was a praying man. That before every meal he blessed it. That before every gathering of people he went up and he prayed and then he retreated again to pray that before every difficult moment in his life he reached out to God and spoke to God. We talked about the fact that it's very likely that the prayer he prayed often was the Shema, which is a Jewish prayer that was ancient even in his time. One of my colleagues a couple weeks ago read us that quotation from Louise Penny's first novel, Still Life, and quoted Detective Gamache saying that there are these four sentences that we all need to be able to say. The first of them is, I need help. And then, I was wrong, I don't know, and I'm sorry. I may not have them in the perfect order, but you get the idea. But there are these four basic sentences, and he argued that the clergy needs to be able to say those sentences. I don't know. I need help. I was wrong. And I'm sorry. And it occurred to me that not just clergy or not just people in Detective Gamache's novels need to know these sentences, that, but we all need to know and practice these sentences but the strength of those prayers, because they are the core of a prayer, is to be vulnerable. To be vulnerable to God and to be vulnerable to each other. And beginning in that vulnerability comes our ability to be connected and then to find the resources that we might need. The joy, the hope, the healing, the justice. It all begins with vulnerability and opening ourselves up one to another. We talked about the fact that last week, when we were thinking about the prayers that Christ prayed, that three of them that are listed occur in the Garden of Gethsemane. That in his darkest hour, he actually prayed, and Lori read it for us, If it is thy will, take this cup from me. He knew that he was in mortal danger because of the way he lived and the ministry that he chose and the calling that he had from his God. And it was hard. And he struggled with it. And sometimes he had great fear 
there's hope. And he knew that he could do whatever he was setting out to do, but sometimes he worried and he struggled. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, his followers fell asleep while he prayed and struggled and sweat poured down his body because of how difficult the challenge ahead of him was. And how helpful for us to know that the one that we follow struggled in that way. He got down on his knees and he worried and he wondered and he asked for relief and he asked for help. Because Martin Luther King, who we hold up as a great champion of civil rights, who we consider to be almost like a living saint among us in the last century, struggled the same way. It wasn't easy to choose nonviolence or to become the leader and the face of a movement that was so deeply resisted. That put people's bodies and lives on the line to create the change that he believed in. And even live in a world where other people were choosing violence in order to make change when he was choosing nonviolence. And there were times when he said, I am so tired, I can't do this alone. I don't even know if I can go on. And frequently, when he felt that deeply in despair, he would turn to music. He would call someone up and ask somebody to sing him a song or find a place where he could hear a hymn that would get to the core of his hope, that would name the problems that assailed him and then take him beyond those pains and hurts and fears to a place that was bigger, to a place that might be feeling further away, that but gave him the strength to reach and to keep on trying for one more day. Surely Christ also reached for song. He reached for the Psalms. And 2,000 years later, the people that lead movements of change, which are also rooted in the same faith, that grow out of following the way of Christ, are rooted in reaching for help. Reaching for hope. Because when you become vulnerable and you reach out and you say, I need help, there is help waiting for you. And we know it because we live it every day. Sometimes we are the embodiment of hope and help for other people. And sometimes we are the ones that have had to break our lives open and be humbled and turn everything around and say, I need help. When was the last time in your own life, in the last few days, when you had to ask for help somehow? Simple or big? Did you need help opening a jar? Turning a can opener? Learning something new? Making your phone work so that you could get something done? We all need hope and sometimes it's easy to ask for it and sometimes it's really, really hard. I hold up our community because we are so good at helping people. Serafina, whom we mean, named today, the mother of two children at Jackson Grammar School, has had to turn her life over to her friends and ask for help so that she can be present to her children and present to the experience of healing and being treated for cancer. And so people are bringing meals to her house every day. That's one way that we tangibly offer help to each other. But it starts because she's willing to say, I need help, and she opens up her life. And then, because she spreads out the work of taking care of her family and lets other people take care of her, then she can do what she needs to take care of herself and her children. And most of you know that Chris and I have lived this lesson, that for six years, over and over again, we had to say, yes, we need help. We had to buy a freezer to handle the amount of meals that were delivered to us because we were at Children's Hospital Boston with our daughter for so long. 
one of my friends, Martha, is sitting right there in the back, and she brought her share of meals. And when we came home and we needed respite, she let us stay in her little quiet room so that we could hide from everybody else and just be a family again for a couple of days before we went back out into the great big world. We love each other and we take care of each other. We're giving rides to people that need to go to Portland for care. We're making phone calls to our friends and our volunteer fire department is answering the call at 3 in the morning to try to save somebody's business. And they're putting themselves in harm's way and our children are serving in the military and being called up to at least be vigilant, if not go into active duty again in warfare. We have learned the lesson or we have observed the lesson of Christ asking for help. But sometimes we have to learn it again and again and again and put down our own pride and say, yes, I need your help. Yes, I need you. Yes, for me to get by or to be present where I need to be present. I need to be in this community and let this community love me. It's easy to love other people and help other people. It's very empowering. It's harder to let other people love you and help you. But that is the language of vulnerability. That is the language of connection. That is the language of the people that follow Christ, that we allow others to love us and help us when we need it, so that when it's our turn and when others need us, we are able to be present to others too. Did you know that Martin Luther King almost did not deliver the I Have a Dream speech? He had a whole other speech prepared during that march on Washington because his advisors told him that the I Had a Dream speech was cliché. But there was a woman that he turned to quite frequently for hope and help. Her name is Mahalia Jackson. And she used to sing hymns for him when he needed hope in his darkest hour. And she was standing on the stage with him during the march on Washington. And he had started into the speech that was prepared for him. And she leaned towards him and she said, Martin, tell him about the dream. And he put down the prepared speech. And he moved into the speech, which was, I have a dream. And we remember it as one of the greatest speeches that was ever offered to our country with hope and vision and tenacity for believing that together, for each of us, for all of us, a different world is possible, a world that can be changed through our work, through our hope. And because we say, I need help, and I need you and you and you to help me make the change that will make this world different for my children too. And on the day that he was in a city working with the sanitation workers, a few years later, and his movement wasn't quite so popular because there had been violence as opposed to the nonviolence that he advocated. And he knew he was in danger. He stood in a hotel balcony and he shouted out to a musician on the street who was going past, who was going to be playing music later that night. Play me, precious Lord, take my hand and play it for me. I mean, really play it for me. And they went back and forth and back and forth. Five times that musician promised, yeah, I'm going to play it for you. Precious Lord, take my hand. I'm going to play it for you. And Martin said, I need it. Play it for me. I really need it. And he turned to go back into his room, and he was assassinated. His last request was for a song that would give him hope in the midst of the very hard work that he was doing. And it's not on our playlist today, but I asked the choir to give it their best try. So if you guys could stand up and come forward. I want you to hear how Martin Luther King reached for hope until the very last minutes of his lifetime.
in the corner. And speaking of the power of prayer, and the power of asking others to help you, Meg is going to Honduras. And some of you probably bought her baskets. She goes, not every year, but her husband gave her as a birthday present, a trip to Honduras. We're not going to speculate on what it means that her husband's sending her away for her birthday. <laughs> but we know that she loves going there, and she thought she would be going this year, and now she is. And so, Meg, if you would come forward, this is going to require that you all sort of move in your seats if you can. Maybe we'll have you stand here. And we're going to make a human chain of hands, and we're going to do a laying on of hands. And we're going to pray for Meg and bless her on her way to work with the people of Honduras. So put your hands on each other. Put your hands on Meg if you're close by. Everybody, everybody, come on over if you can. And if you can't quite reach across, then... Yeah, let's make sure we've got human chain and everybody's touching everybody. And Meg, what would you hope for on your mission to Honduras? I hope for peace and uh, rejuvenation for the people that are there. Continue hope for them that their lives will be better and better and they won't have to leave their country and uh, escape to another place. So Meg, Paige... Prays for peace and rejuvenation for the people that are in Honduras. She prays for a sustainable peace that means that they can stay in their own homeland and not have to leave it, fleeing for elsewhere for safety. We pray also for Meg, for the people have the, who have the vision to create Honduras hope to have made such a difference in the lives of those that they are working with. And for the people in Honduras who say how they can best be helped in partnership with this organization. This is a partnership and a reciprocity. But Meg is our representative into this part of the world. And she is the walking hand of help and hope for our community to Honduras. Let us send her our blessings. We bless you, Meg. May you go out safe and return safe. In case you couldn't tell, we're doing a series on prayer, and so Detective Gamash is going to launch us into many topics, beginning today with praying for help. If you all would rise for the song 80, Our God, Our Help in Ages Past. anticipated that they were going to be spending two more nights in freezing weather 
outside in the woods. And because of the help that you are able to provide, we ended up providing emergency shelter for them overnight for two nights. And then they'll be connecting with other nonprofits that can give more sustainable help. When I tell you that whether it is internationally or here in this community, that the help you give closes the gap where other things can't help, I do mean it. You are literally passing along hope, safety, and help to people right here in this valley and in Honduras and in Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe and Australia and other parts of the world. Thank you.